Hello and welcome. This is Cashflow 2.0, the only podcast that walks you through the treacherous jungles of your financial statements and leads you on a path to not only overcoming some of the most costly mistakes that many new entrepreneurs make, but helps you make your money start working for you right now. Sweet. Join us today as Pam changes your financial future and makes finance fun. Hey, this is Pam and I want to welcome you back here. I am honored to have on my podcast today the gentleman who is responsible for creating two of the best books written for entrepreneurs. And the thing, one of the many things I love about them is that they serve both the solopreneur who's there by themselves and the 10 figure entrepreneur who's got a whole team in place. And that person is Mike Michalowicz, who I'm thrilled to have here, author of a number of books, but most recently Clockwork which I'm going to definitely have him talk about today, and one that you probably know even more right now, which is Profit First. And I want to introduce Mike and then also have him tell us a little bit about himself before we dive right into the gold hiding in these pages. Hey, Mike, welcome. Pam, thank you so much for having me on your show. I appreciate this. Uh, and I have to confess, because I always tell the truth for poor Mike, this is our second round, because I had him go through all of this and I forgot to hit record. So that just goes to show you what a flexible guy he is. <laughs> and I appreciate that so much. So tell us a little bit about your mission, Mike. Yeah, so it's funny we talked about this in our first try, right? First attempt yeah. <laughs> at this. Is it's to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. And uh, the... I came upon this, which I didn't share the first time is, you know, I'm an entrepreneur my entirety in the entirety of my adult life ever since I graduated college. And I've had the good fortune of selling a couple companies, uh, one to private equity. I sold one to a fortune 500 and my ego exploded thinking that I knew everything about business. Um, but what's interesting now in retrospect, I had some good fortunate timing that I didn't put much value in. I just was in the right place at the right time. My third attempt was a disaster. I became an angel investor because I knew everything about business, I would start all these different businesses uh, and I destroyed them all, uh, evaporating. <laughs> eva I actually call myself the angel of death. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I evaporated uh, all my wealth. I, these businesses failed abjectly and that became an awakening for me, a realization I knew almost nothing about entrepreneurship. Um, and it put me on wow. a new journey. You know, there's an interesting question you can ask yourself. We've all heard, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? And I believe that's a nice question, but it's not the entirety of the question. It's nice because it, it says, you know, if you had the freedom, you know, financial freedom to do what you want, what do you feel most called to do? Problem is it presupposes that you need all the money in the world to do that. And that's wrong. Oh, that is a great turn on that phrase. That is just brilliant. Right? So I found there's another question. When you have no money, and I was in fact broke, I had no money. If you answer that question, what would you do when you have no money as a vocation to support yourself? If that matches, if you can match that with what would you do when you have all the money and you have no money, if it's the same answer, that is your life's calling. And I remember dreaming one day, I'll be an author one day. I'm going to become an author. I want to be a, uh, some kind of author, but you know, I need to have a lot of money to do that. Then when I had no money, I said, I, I'm going to be an author, but I'm going to make this a path of a financial wealth for myself, freedom, and the ability to serve my life's purpose. My life's purpose that says to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. Mm -hmm. I, I feel, I, I found that most entrepreneurs, there's this perception of success, especially when you start your business, your friends think you're millionaires. They think you don't work. You, you sit on the beach all the time, <laughs> hang out. But the reality is we are struggling, surviving check by check to get by. We are working our tails off. And so there's this misperception. I want to fix that. I want to make sure entrepreneurs have time, have money, have wealth, and can do what they're called to do. So I've devoted my last 10 years to that calling and the rest of my life will be devoted to this calling. I just love that mission. And there, there are a couple of things in there I want to dig around a little bit. And the first is, um, you know, just a kind of a, my, a story about my background. I've actually only been an entrepreneur here for about two and a half years. I worked in corporate America, some of those Fortune 500s that you mentioned at the beginning that you sold your company to. Yeah. And I, of course, came out of corporate saying, you know, hey, I'm ready for this entrepreneur thing. Right. Most people might need an 18 month runway, but me, six months and I'm up and running. Right. And I went at it like everybody goes at it. And sure enough, within six months, I was on this amazing hamster wheel yeah. where I was working more and more and more and making less and less and less. Uh, even though I was, you know, theoretically the person who should know how to do this, having done so much in industry. And the truth of the matter is, 
your books are a great thing to interject right at step one mm. so that you set up the infrastructure early. And it's not an infrastructure like something that drops like a hammer and turns your organization into a bureaucracy. In fact, it's the opposite. It says, here are the things to think about so that you don't let your week expand to a hundred hour week and all the money you have. Instead, let's help you define what you want to do, how you want to do it. And I want to dig in on the, the QBR in your book because it's so enlightening to me. But what is it you want to do? How do you want to do it? What are your resources for doing it? And then set your limits. That to me was the bell that went off in my head. It's the same for money and time. Yes. Yeah. We must set limits uh, that are irrevocable, meaning we can't bust through it. You know, some people put money aside for savings and then they borrow from it because it's an emergency to buy that new computer or whatever, and they defeat the system. So we need to set Mm -hmm. irrevocable things. There's also this other challenge. It's called axioms. An axiom is an established belief that just perpetuates through society. Mm -hmm. We just know it to be true and you, therefore you don't even need to challenge it. The thing is some axioms are total bullshit. <laughs> and true. So one of the axioms that floats around the entrepreneurial community is, you know, you got to grind and hustle. Uh, we're hearing it a lot now. Uh, it used to be called workaholism, but now it's called ground and hustle. And there's this uh, idiotic pride associated with it. Like, oh, you know, I worked a hundred hours. And so I, while well, I understand the sentiment is entrepreneurship is hard work. Yep. If you believe it's only hard work, that's all you ever do. And you've defeated the growth of moving into smart work. Um, so we got to challenge these axioms. It's not about grinding out a hundred hours every week. It's not about grow until one day you're profitable. It is, isn't pump and dump. Mm-hmm. We have to break those established axioms and look at our own behaviors around business, capture our behaviors and channel them to the outcomes we want. And that's why I try my when I write my books, I try to help people channel what they're already doing, but not to achieve frustration, but to achieve, you know, success as they define it. Oh, folks, you want to rewind and replay on that like I'm going to. That is brilliance right there. And the thing, the additional thing that, that I wanted to mention about this that you've pointed out here is your books really apply to entrepreneurs who are just starting out. I mean, mm-hmm. hugely helpful to read and get that in place. And I will be coming back to the QBR because I just think it's so critical. Oh, yeah, we got to tackle that but also to eight, nine, 10 figure businesses. So one of the best bosses I ever had, I loved him and hated him, right? And we had gone through a major ERP implementation at DuPont and it was, uh, you know, months and months of work. And we had finally got our ability to close the books, which basically means we could report our financials for a month. And we had all stayed in work the entire weekend and we were sweating and tired and dirty and but we had done it, damn it. We had closed those books. And I remember going into his office with my work partner and we said, hey, Steve, we did it. You know, we really got to celebrate this team. And he looked at me, he said, we'll celebrate it when you can do it without working overtime. Oh. And I remember that was in uh, long ago, but let's just call it the 90s. Yeah. And it was, it, one, I was so angry at him, like so angry. Yeah. But he was so right. It was interesting when, when that anger is triggered, that usually means it's hit, it struck a chord. Yep. Um, it's funny. When I tell people you got to take your profit first, um, I can't tell you how many people uh, re- re- retaliate against it, particularly in established communities like accounting and bookkeeping, where we've always been told profit doesn't come first, profit comes last. It's yep. the bottom line, mm-hmm. right? We hear over and over. I tell people it doesn't work. And then they hear about profit first, like that's nonsense. And that's t- no, everyone knows you have to take your profit last. And I say, but how many of your clients are profitable? They're like, well, none of them are profitable. Everyone's surviving check by check. I'm like, well, it's not working. And they're like, oh, sh- <laughs> <laughs> can't we, handle this. <laughs> we cling, and I get it. And I also, I get it. we cling, and I do too. We cling to our established beliefs. And right. We defend it. We but don't even it, realize they're established beliefs. That, they don't. We don't. But don't it, I'll tell you one trigger is if it makes us irate or angry or upset, that means it struck a chord. There's something we need to explore there. I, challenge I hate that, don't you? I yeah. hate it. When I get mad, I automatically go, oh, okay, there's something I'm doing here that needs fixing. It's like, darn it, can I just be mad? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I'm in an accountability group, and what we do is it's not traditional accountability. Like, did you do it? Did you not do it? Uh-huh. If you did do something or didn't do something, they simply ask, well, why didn't you do it? And One, after being in this group, I've been in for uh, seven years now. One year into it, one of the people says, Mike, I got to call you out on something. I said, yeah, what is it? They said, you're a martyr. 
I'm like, what? <laughs> like, you know, like Jack, I'm like, you're I'm not a martyr. I'm like, you know, you're just railing against me. Everyone rails against me. I'm like, oh my God, I'm a martyr. I'm a martyr. <laughs> as you were the words coming out of your mouth, right? I got, yeah, as I'm, as I'm behaving that way. And what I realize is there's a certain default uh, response I have, yes. which is this martyrdom. And by making this an awareness now, I can't necessarily stop it, man. I can't totally stop it, but I'm aware of it. It's conscious. I can now redirect around it. If I'm defaulting yeah, back yeah. to that mode, I can, re, 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 you know, change my behavior or at least observe my behavior and change things before I go into the deep end. Right. And that's part of the goal of these books too, is if we follow a path, often, even though we're careening out of control, we actually throttle into it and that becomes even a bigger problem. That is a great, great point. And, and I do want to jump into clockwork, actually, just yeah. because one of the things I was telling Michael is I, I'm a little bit angry at him because I uh, love to skim books. Like, yeah, just yeah. I'm, I can pull out the important parts and skim right through it. But with Michael's book, every single sentence appears to have nuggets because I keep, every time I tried to skim, I kept circling back and reading two, well, there's the two pages I skimmed and there's the other two I skimmed because it's so tied together and so beautifully sequential Thank you. that with reading it and really reading it, you cannot walk away without an action plan for your business. Whether you are just starting, like I, I basically took notes on the book and then took notes on how I was going to put it in place on my business. And you wonderfully have a website where I can go get all the forms that I need to do it. And it's not painful. It's not um, tedious. It's all the things that make sense Mm -hmm. So the big point in your book that I think we've, we've talked about a little bit is this QBR, yeah. Queen Bee role. And I think it's really the essence of the book because everything hinges on that. And I know you were saying you've been able to expand on that a little bit. So what can you tell us about the Queen Bee role? Yeah. So since the publication of the book, uh, uh, and I've been teaching it, I actually have a small organization uh, that's running, uh, we coach around clockwork and uh, have simplified the process even further. So let's define it and I'll tell you how to find it for your own business. The QBR stands for Queen B role. It is the most important activity within your business that your business is actually hinging its success on. Very few businesses have identified it. We think everything's important. Um, so this thing gets addressed occasionally, but sporadically and not uh, deliberately. The term Queen B role comes from actually beehives. Beehives are very efficient in scaling mm -hmm. and in a queen, in a beehive, the most important function, and again, this is a function, not an individual bee, the most important function or activity is the production of eggs. Bees live, some species live for four weeks, other ones can live to four or five months. They have a very short lifespan. There's a lot of turnover. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so we need egg production, and every bee is programmed to know this. One bee happens in a beehive, the queen bee is serving this function of actually producing the eggs. Um, but all the bees support the activity. They will change the temperature of the hive. They can do it by rubbing their wings or flapping them. They'll produce nectar or, or bring nectar in to feed the queen bee and the other bees. They'll move eggs around. It's all about egg production. But one point of confusion though is when people start hearing this analogy, they go, oh, that means there's one person, a queen bee in my organization. I'm no. glad you brought that up. That was yeah. eye opening to me. No. There's a queen bee role. There's a function that matters. In small business, there's often a single person serving it, but ideally we want many people serving it. Um, so that's protected. The queen bee is not the most important bee in a beehive. She is expendable. If she's not producing eggs out of there, it's the <laughs> egg production that matters. They will remove her and they'll spawn a new queen bee. Here's the, in, in the book, I give a strategy of doing deductive uh, logic to get there, taking yep. sticky notes and so forth. I have an, actually an easier method, and Ooh. I'll share an example on how to do it. This is not in the book. This is the new stuff. Oh, great. FedEx, as the example, has a brand promise. I call it the big promise, and every business has it. Pam, your business has it. Mm -hmm. My business has it. Most of us don't identify it, but what's the one biggest promise we make to our customers? For me, as an author, it's taking complex subjects and making them very simple and digestible to move your business forward. That's my big promise. My mission is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty, my promise is when you read one of my books, I will take a complex subject and make it digestible for you and actionable. Well, then we have to, once we know our big promise, the one for FedEx, by the way, is delivering packages on time. Mm -hmm. They have that famous commercial, but absolutely positively it needs to yep. be delivered overnight. <laughs> that's their big promise. And that's why we use FedEx. I want my packages to be delivered fast and on time. 
Then we peel, that's the promise. We peel back the onion just one layer and say, what's the one activity that most makes that promise actually happen? Got and for it. Fed, FedEx, it's logistics. It's the activity of moving the packages. They don't have one guy running every single package around the world. Right. They have a whole team serving that queen bee roll. But the one activity is the queen bee roll. Now, the importance of this is whatever the queen bee roll is for your business, you must ensure that it's functioning optimally at all times. The better it functions, your entire business will elevate like a tide rises all boats. If it's compromised, the entire business is compromised. And here's the example of FedEx. If FedEx says, you know what, let's, let's not invest so much in logistics anymore. Let's be the friendliest organization. Let's have great customer service. Let's just kind of, uh, you know, if someone calls up accidentally and wants to order a pizza, we'll deliver it for them. <laughs> You know? Oh my gosh. You know, I laugh at that, but it's so common that we do that in our businesses. Yeah. And the, order but could you imagine like FedEx like saying, you know, if the packages don't get delivered in time, who cares? We would never buy from FedEx again. Right. If FedEx says, we don't, we don't want to get there, but here's the pizza. We got it. And yet so, we make those decisions every day. Every day, every day. Mm -hmm. the, the irony is you get to pick it. So uh, Zappos as a comparative, they do promise, uh, to, or if you accidentally order a pizza from them to get you a pizza, to spend four hours on the phone with you. Yep. They deliver happiness. That's their promise. FedEx delivers on time. That's their promise. So what is your big promise? Then peel back the onion and say, what's the one activity? I know you do hundreds of things to support that, but what's the one most important thing? Mm -hmm. Concentrate on that being elevated at all times to the point where FedEx knows that if their logistics are ever threatened, they have to shift the organization significantly. And they do do it every year, right around now. Yep. Around the winter holidays, package demand skyrockets. More packages shipped than, during, than any other time in the year. What does FedEx do? Does FedEx say, you drivers better drive faster and run when you deliver packages? No. They tell the managers, get your ass from out behind that chair and get out on the, the trucks and start driving yourself. Hire extra help. Get more people working in the warehouse. Always protect the QBR. That's the lesson for us. That's I love that. And the way that it's laid out in this this brilliant book, and, and there the thing that I want you to know about this is that there are steps for identifying it. In addition, you've just given us a new one for identifying what is yep. which I'm gonna do when when we're through today is you know, what is the promise and what is the activity? The big thing is it's one activity. It's one one yep. thing. And then the process that you take us through in the book helps you get, it doesn't just say that's it and go away. You help us align our organization around that now so yes. that it is the primary focus for everybody. So that if, you know, if your admin is needed in order to help deliver on whatever that thing is that serves your promise, you redirect your admin to do that. It's not just my role as the owner of the company. Yes. So it's interesting. The traditional uh, organizational chart is they call it a pyramid. You have someone up top. So the whole scheme is you have a, someone up top and the next layer, next layer. Yeah. By the way, it's a pyramid scheme, right? So, uh, <laughs> so true. Yeah. Right. So, but we, we organize around authority. We don't mm -hmm. organize around a QBR. So this new model, you put the QBR is in the middle as the heart of your organization. If you watched uh, Iron Man, this is the arc reactor, right? Yep. This gives you the energy. Then you build the structure around it, which is much more like a web structure. Webs are extremely strong. In fact, this is just an interesting aside. I read in Popular Science, a recent study, uh, they use a supercomputer to develop the strongest yet lightest structure. So a column, how do you make a column super strong yet super light? And what the supercomputer came up with was like a web-like structure. It wasn't like lots of arcs or different kind of traditional architecture. It was just like this web. So when you look at it, it just looks like this weird web, but it was super strong. It was the equivalent of having a solid uh, column. Yeah. They were able to take pieces out. That's how you have to build our organization. You take your people's talents and you match it to the tasks that need it. Don't match talents to titles. Oh, I need a receptionist. I need a salesperson and a president. Match those talents to the tasks that need it to protect the QBR and serve the QBR and your business will get stronger and lighter at the same time. And that's the brilliance of it. And then you add that to your recruiting process as well, which you touch on. Exactly. You're going to hire the people. You don't hire the title. You hire the role that's needed yes. in all of its pieces, both the primary piece to protect the QPR and whatever you need secondarily from that exactly. particular role, which, which is brilliant. The other thing that I really liked that you talked about in here 
Um, I think you mentioned it came from, I can't remember his name, but it's a four step process for identifying um, oh, where did it go here? I've got it in my notes. We're talking about Scott Alford. Uh, yes. About uh, outcome. Yes. Design, and yeah. It, yeah. That delegating is a process, right? It's it was fascinating. A step. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I really like that. And shout out to Scott. Cause- yeah, shout out to Scott. I met him. I was at a uh, mastermind event, but coincidentally hosted by Chris Winfield, our mutual friend. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. Yeah. He brought me over to uh, Selena Sue, one of his friend's apartments. Yeah. Okay, so Selena and so we're hosting it. Scott Olford was there, and uh, I was going to speak there. So I was only passively listening, and I hear this guy talking. I'm like, this is gold. Now, I'm going to give you kind of the arc. It's not necessarily broken into four steps, but he does break into four steps, and it's in the book. Mm-hmm. Most people, uh, when we hire employees, we assign tasks. I call it task rabbiting. I love Typically, that. Like, if you hired me, Pam, you might say, hey, Mike, I need you to do invoicing. I say, okay. And you say, uh, to do invoicing, you know, do step one, step two, step three. But what this often uh, degradates to very quickly is I'll come back to you with a question a minute later and say, oh, did you want me to sort by last name or first name? And you'll make a decision saying, you know what, we do it by last name here, Mike. Okay, I'll come back a minute later and say, oh, um, did you want me to invoice in increments of 15 minutes or an hour? And you're like, oh, we've never done that. Let's just do hourly increments. Okay, and I keep coming back with this incessant questioning which in the beginning shows that I'm learning, but when this continues on for weeks or months, then it becomes so frustrating. Like, am I a moron? Can I not figure this out? The problem of this stage of businesses that so many businesses are stuck in is we're not, we're not truly delegating. You know, we call it delegation. We're assigning tasks, but we're retaining the ownership of responsibility over it. So therefore, the employee comes back with constant questions because they don't want to do something wrong, and we decide for them which we feel it's just faster to tell them to really teach them anyway. I'm the genius. I call it the superhero complex. You know, I believe Superman, quite frankly, kind of is a jerk. (laughs) And and, and not to be sexist, Wonder Woman is too. (laughs) Here's the deal, yo. They swoop in and fix problems. And I know that seems so heroic, but they're, they're disabling mankind from protecting themselves. Mankind can't beat Lex Luthor. We have, we have to beg for Superman to come again. And by the way, Superman leaves this wake of destruction behind him. The whole, all those buildings are knocked down and stuff. He's like, oh, sorry, guys, my bad. You fix that part. Oh, my gosh, let's, so true. Let's not be a superhero. Let's be a supervisionary. And this is where we're going to move to. We want to have a clarity on where we're taking our business, but then orchestrate the resources, our people, the software, to do it themselves. That's what we should do. And Scott Olford moved us to this higher level of true delegation. Love delegation that. is not the assignment of tasks. It's the assignment of outcomes. Yep. So, so that's the scenario. You, you're, I'm your, uh, your employee, Pam. You said to me, hey, Mike, I need you to uh, invoice our clients because it's important that we build people accurately and timely. That's how we support our business. So the outcome is timely and accurate billing. Do you understand that? And does that land with you? I say, yes. Then you say, we have a best practice. Here's our invoicing practice up to this point. But that's simply our best practice till today. As you go through this, if you have questions or challenges or see opportunities for improvement, it's your job to address them. I've hired you for what's on that shoulder of yours, that head. So I want you to find the solutions for us. Now, still going to be my tendency as an employee to come back to you and say, well, I don't know what I should do here. And you say, well, Mike, what's your decision? You must push the decision back on me, which many people know. They don't execute on that, but many people know. It's this final step that almost no one knows and therefore no one does. Mm -hmm. When I start making decisions, whatever decision I make, you as my employer must support that decision and say, good job, Mike, even the bad decisions. That's the scary part. If if I say, okay, I'm doing invoicing and and I come back and say, Pam, I have a great idea. We're going to sort people not by the last name or first name. How about their middle initial? That's the way we're proceeding. You have to say, you have to bite your tongue and say, okay, uh, that is so awesome you made a decision. I know you feel that's in the best interest of the business. Now, we're not achieving the outcome we want uh, because it's actually causing confusion for the rest of our business. But the fact you made a decision that moved us forward, it's awesome. Keep it up. Now, get back in there. Maybe you have to make a new decision, but make it even more effective. Yep. We have to support. But most entrepreneurs say, are you a freaking idiot? You, middle initial? What, you don't know my middle initial. How are we ever going to figure out all these people? You're... You're demoted. You're fired. I'll just do it myself. Superman and Wonder Woman have returned, and we destroy the entire company. 
And by the yeah. way, clearly this company will never be able to run without me doing everything. Oh, I, I know. Force that ridiculous. There, there are two things that I think I really like, again, about that you explore in your book is that in order to do that, you have to set the context for people and you have to really define what is, what are your company principles? You know, what is it that, what is your QBR and, and, and why Our, and, and you broke it down into, um, you know, let's put one sentence in front of everybody. Our commitment is to serve blank by doing blank. Yeah. And if everybody has that in context, then they've got the context to make those decisions and you've just elevated the opportunity for them to be the right decisions. Yes. Number one. And the second piece of it is feedback. So, yep. They're going to make mistakes, and if they don't, they're probably not taking on that decision-making and, and accountability responsibility. Our job then is to just give the feedback. That was great. It was a great step, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll just give actually a perfect example. I, I have an admin who handles all my travel stuff. Right. Fantastic job. She knows me inside and out. At the, on the last trip, I had a little bit shorter time than I like in a layover. Okay. So, and I thought, oh, I have shorter time than I thought. Well, it occurred to me, oh. I just have to let her know that and exactly. it'll never happen again. But if exactly. I don't and exactly. just sit there and go, you know, gosh, you know, I have a short time later. Why isn't she thinking about me? Why? You know, and I wonder one thing with those, that exact scenario, <laughs> we can say, Hey, I need more time for layovers. Or we can say actually a greater question saying, I, I need the comfort to know that I can make these transitions and travel uh, yep. with, without concern because then, then I lose my focus. What are things we could do to do this? And when Be she better. says, you know what? We can expand the time for layovers. Now she's taking ownership. It's not a directive. She's Great taking ownership. Point. But she also may discover other things. Oh, you know what? Sometimes when you're Ubering over to the venue you're going to, um, there could be traffic. What I'll do is I will, you know, uh, expand that time so that uh, if you hit traffic, there's no rush to make sure you arrive a little bit earlier. So we're going to move actually the plane flights back. And then if you arrive at a hotel early, which may happen when there's no traffic, I'm going to have the concierge a heads up to make sure that there's a, a room serve, reserved for you, like the business conference room, that there's a reserved for Pam note there so that you have the free time to, to catch up when, when you have free time. Love like, that. It, it, we can trigger this thought train. So if we give specific directive, people will follow the directive, but they'll start to uh, become subservient to us yeah. as a directive. Love that. That is, that is great insight for me. See, I got my own, my own coaching here. So thank you. That's really, really <laughs> true. You know, what's, what's the outcome that we want? Focus yeah. on the outcome and let people, once you've given them the tools and the training. Another <laughs> thing I loved about your book is creating these tools and the training is not as hard as we think. You don't oh, have so a manual. Turn on the screencast recorder and just yeah. record. I found, as I, so I researched out hundreds of businesses and, and ultimately called it down to about 24 businesses I included in the book and researched out all these businesses that were very efficient. And what I found is SOPs are like so 80s now, you know, <laughs> no one reads SOPs. The interesting thing too is as you produce an SOP, we are so dependent upon technology and technology is advancing so quickly. You could write a process, you know, to use UPS to ship something. And the day the SOP is done, UPS has updated its website, making your SOP irrelevant. So true. The faster way now is, yeah, you screen capture software if you're doing computer-based stuff. If it's manual, stuff like you're packaging something, or if it's visual or audio, like it's a phone call, mm -hmm. you need your smartphone to capture all that stuff. Right. So use those tools to capture the practice, give it to the employee, and always say, this is the best practice. It's not the only practice. Your job is to improve upon it. You'll be, become the decision maker. And mm -hmm. this is the key. Make them make the training video again for their own words. Because the best student in every classroom is the teacher. Don't have them great following point. the script, have them teach the script. Great, great point. And then, and one more thing I just want to point out, and you still need to read the whole book. Remember I told you, just because you're getting all these pointers from this conversation, you want to read the whole book all the way through because this is truly just uh, skimming the surface. But yeah. once you have all of those things, you might be thinking, oh my God, I've got you know, 35 different training things, but you have a very clear way about how to organize them in a directory that lines up with how every business operates. So could, do you mind touching on that quickly? Yeah, we followed this concept called the role chart. And the role chart is, there's, there's two types of organizational structures that are common. One is, I call it the pyramid scheme, just joking around, but that is a title-based chart. A role chart is actually the functions and the flowing of the business, and they rarely match up. The roles is how do you get the, you know, from 
attracting customer all the way to ultimately delivering on the goods and collecting the money that they owe you. So you can create a structure on some kind of sur- uh, shared platform, yep. you know, Google or some kind of Google cloud. Drive, drive, Dropbox, whatever. Yeah. And then uh, you, the people have to know what roles are serving. You know, I'm attracting customers. Oh, I'm in the attract component. And there we have all of our different marketing methods and stuff. And we label the videos, these recordings uh, that they can follow and click on to refer to. Mm-hmm. And then once they own it, they update it themselves. So we have this constantly growing and enhancing uh, procedural system that right. replaces SOPs. So much better than a manual. And, and yeah. just to kind of walk through those steps, it's, it's AC, DC, just to remember them. But you've got your tract, yep. you convert, yep. you deliver, and yep. you deliver. Yep. And by the way, you know, ACDC is the best band ever. So let's just get that off the table. <laughs> but it's also the best model. Now, the interesting thing is not all businesses follow that sequence. Some businesses are ACCD. True. They attract customers, they attract prospects, they convert them to customers. Then they collect the money in advance, a retainer. Then they deliver the goods. Yep. There's some cool. businesses, this is kind of crazy, that are ADCC. They attract prospects, then deliver the goods before they become a customer or pay. And that's called spec work. 99 designs does this all the time. You can go out there and say, I want to hire someone. Everyone make my logo. And I'm going to pick one of the best fifties. So you actually do the work in advance. Then they become a, one of those people will become their customer and pay them. So the models work differently, but there's always, once you know your flow, there's always a sequence of flow, build your structure around that. And then you're all set. And yep. that, that makes a ton of sense. And I, I, this is, I want to keep going for like an hour here. I could go on and geek out about all this forever because this is just amazing stuff. I'm really glad I have read Mike's books, even though I am angry at him for making me read every page. Uh, also probably a little bit angry at him for thinking of all this stuff because it's brilliant. And it really is. It, it, he pointed out in his conversation that you like to take the complex and make it simple. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is you do that in these books. And I'm really, really honored to uh, have the chance to talk with you about them. So um, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I, we will be staying in touch for sure. For sure. A lot of mutual right. friends. Thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this. Please stay tuned for next week's podcast, which will drop at the same time, same place. And uh, look for us on Facebook. Mike, where can my folks reach out to you if they want to get more information? Oh, thank uh, you. Learn more about you. Thank you for letting me share. It's MikeMotorbike.com. I mean, it's MikeMichalowitz.com, but I struggle with spelling my last name still. So MikeMotorbike.com. All my books are up there, all my resources. I'm also a podcaster and blogger. And I used to write for the Wall Street Journal. All that stuff's up there for free. Oh, perfect. Thanks so much. Be sure and go out and visit this stuff. I will tell you that it's some of the best that I've seen out there, folks. Have a great week.